thanks very much to Gloria, and I'm so honored and thrilled to be here and to be invited by Gmall, and so thrilled to see you all. I was gonna say thank you for coming out on a rainy night, but I suppose that actually helped me because no barbecue weather is kind of better in this case. Although it's, it's sort of sleepy weather, so I'll try not to put you all to sleep this evening. I don't usually weigh in on public policy. It's sort of a tenet of journalism that you don't. And it's one that I've taken deeply to heart over the years. And you know, it's actually been a great help to me because I have no temptation to reply to anyone on Facebook, which you know, so many people seem to struggle with that. But writing this talk made me feel deeply uncomfortable because I just have this desire uh, not, to, not to be the one spouting, but to let others do the talking and then to try to poke holes in their arguments. So every time I tried to make a declarative sentence in writing this talk, the other part of my brain would go, well, you know, if you look at it from another side. <laughs> but we're in a pretty perilous place for journalism right now. And so today I'm going to share with you a little bit of the concern that I have and many of my colleagues share as well as some of the conversations that we've been having within the journalism circles about the way we think about our own jobs, our ethics, and humanity in journalism. So I was at a dinner party several months ago with some neighbors of mine, which you should know is in and of itself news. I have no life now that I have two shows that I host and two very small children. But we were talking after dinner and one of my neighbors said that she's so confused about what's real and what's not and what's biased and how that she's just given up on reading the news altogether. For context, this woman is in her 50s. She generally identifies as a Republican, but she was a big Bernie Sanders supporter in the last election, and she works in an elementary school. Now, my first inclination when she said that was to roll my eyes and dismiss what she was saying as pretty lazy. I mean, come on. It's not that hard to find reputable news sources. And it's not that hard to do a little bit of research to figure out if what you're reading is biased. And if you'll forgive a digression for a moment, let me just point out some tips for doing just that. Number one, check the source. Do you know it? Do you know its perspective? Do you know whether it's a reported story that you're reading with a byline of someone you can verify? Is it an editorial, a commentary, an opinion piece, or is it being presented as news? Uh, number two, do a quick headline or keyword search. Are other people reporting this information? Does it seem legit? Check your gut. If you can't find any mainstream news sources also reporting this news, you need to do a little more digging. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's false, but you should absolutely look for corroborating evidence and see if they're using the same or different sources and then compare how different media organizations are covering this same story. Number three, is this breaking news and are you on Twitter? If the answer to either of those questions is yes, add a heaping spoonful of skepticism to whatever you are reading and do a lot more research. And for the love of Pete, Please don't retweet it. Read it, take it in, don't spread it until you know it's verified. It is nearly impossible to take back something that's gone viral that's wrong. And most people won't see the correction whenever that goes out. And number four, once you've verified that it is in fact real, don't stop there. Read other sources. I mean, I would say read or listen to what NPR is reporting on this. Read the AP's very straight ahead coverage. Look at the New York Times, read that. Go to Fox News, see what their headline is, their take, read the story, listen to it, watch it. Do the same with Rachel Maddow if you like her. And check out the byline for the stories you're reading. Look at that reporter's other work. Get a good sense of what that reporter does and how he or she operates and at how different news organizations are operating and start to educate yourself on the way different media organizations do their reporting. I know many of you do this already, but one of the things that we've discovered over the last 10 years is that there's not a lot of media literacy out there and that that is partly at fault for some of the ways that people get confused. Oh, and check out media criticism. I really like On the Media, another public radio program that takes the media to task. And I listened to what Jay Rosen, who's a professor at NYU, says. 
He's a pretty vocal critic of public radio, and I often don't like what he's saying, but I always make sure to think about it. So anyway, let me get back to my neighbor. So she says, I'm just not gonna bother reading the news anymore. I can't listen, I don't know what's true or not. And I thought, you know, throwing your hands up in the air and just saying forget it is a major overreaction to the idea that it's a little bit harder now to know which news sources to trust. But then I went home and I thought about her comment and her frustration and how easily I wanted to dismiss it and I reconsidered. So I want to spend a little time talking about this moment that we're in and what it's like to be a news consumer. These, I'm sure, are not new concepts to you, but if you put them all in one place, I think they paint a pretty strong picture of the difficulties we all have in figuring out what's happening in the world at this moment of time. So we have prominent politicians on both sides of the ideological divide telling their supporters not to trust the fake news. It's not just Donald Trump. Bernie Sanders does this too, for example. Lots of politicians and people in power have started using the idea that something is fake as a way to dismiss stories that they don't like or don't want people to focus on. The references our president has made to fake news are legion and more or less daily if you follow his Twitter feed. His dislike of CNN, the failing New York Times, and anyone else printing something that he just doesn't agree with has basically become a joke, fodder for late night television a badge of honor even for some journalists. I'm sure they see him themselves in his tweet along with a nickname, uh, you know, and think, hey, pretty good. At least I'm being noticed. Now maybe you feel like you know what he or another politician calls fake really is. But millions of people do trust what he says and there are plenty of others who find it confusing. Is he right? Is it a witch hunt? Are journalists out to get him because they have a left-wing bias? Could what he's saying at least sometimes be true? Yes. Bernie Sanders invoked a similar idea not so long ago himself, although he didn't actually use the term fake news. The weekly paper Seven Days has not had an opportunity to actually sit down and interview Senator Sanders for more than four years. When Bernie Sanders ran for president, he by and large shunned all of the local media, including VPR. Internally, we were pretty critical of that and very frustrated. Not only because, of course, we wanted the big story, this local politician running for president, but primarily, from my perspective at least, because he remained a sitting senator and has an obligation, I believe, to make himself accessible to his constituents, directly through the live call-in interviews and by proxy through the questions of local journalists who are focused on issues relevant to Vermonters and who can press him in a public forum to answer questions he might not otherwise be obligated to answer. Since the election ended, Senator Sanders has started to do interviews with us again. And that picked up steam as he ran for re-election for his Senate seat last fall. He also granted interviews to most other large Vermont news outlets. But he has not granted seven days an interview. Now, seven days was once known primarily in Chittenden County for um, arts coverage, calendar listings, risque personal ads, but it also has a robust reporting staff which has just grown in recent years as other print media organizations have sort of sloughed off reporters. So it does a really good job of long form investigative journalism. It does so on the opioid crisis, on Burlington issues and politics, and it's also done significant critical but thorough reporting on Senator Sanders and on stories that intersect with him, including reporting that looked at his wife, Jane O'Meara Sanders, and her role in the demise of the now bankrupt and closed Burlington College, of which she used to be the president. So Senator Sanders has continued to refuse to speak to that particular paper. Last year, Seven Days said that Sanders backed out of a scheduled interview because he wasn't able to exact a promise from them that they would ask certain questions and not ask others. Reporter Paul Heinz then essentially tried to ambush Sanders at the airport, and Senator Sanders told Paul Heinz that he didn't want to talk to a gossip magazine. I don't talk to gossip columnists, I talk about issues, the paper quotes him as saying. Sanders may not like the treatment that he's gotten from that paper, but it is not fake news or gossip. 
And for him to suggest as much is a way to discredit that paper, to try to make sure that people who trust him don't trust what they read in seven days. Now certainly politicians and others have always railed against reporting that doesn't paint them in a good light or that covers issues that they individually don't think are priorities. But this propensity to discredit an entire organization or even an entire industry has been building over the last few years to what I would say is now fever pitch, to use a cliche. Stories are not fake news just because you don't like them. And frankly, it's not a politician's job to decide what is or is not worthy of coverage. That being said, I completely understand the criticism that the media gets for focusing on things that are not essential. But I also believe that serious reporters are doing really important work to shine a light on issues that aren't getting a lot of coverage. We are covering policy changes. We are covering what the impact of those policies are. At VPR, for example, in the last year, I'd say, we've been talking with migrant workers about why they don't have documentation and the effects of increased ICE raids on what it takes to report a crime. We've been talking with farmers about what environmental regulations and federal milk pricing policies mean for their bottom line. We've been exploring what kinds of policies might help the opioid problem in the state. We've had round tables of gun owners to talk about firearms regulations that they support and ones that they don't. We've had women on to talk about Me Too. We've had men on to talk about Me Too. We've looked at racism. We've learned what it's like to be a transgender teenager in Vermont. And we even had what I think was actually a fairly remarkable conversation about the nuances in various people's positions about abortions earlier this legislative session. We've covered policy and we cover the personal. So the work is being done. And again, it's not up to those in power to decide what should or should not be covered by journalists. That is literally the job of news directors and reporters. So not only do we have politicians trying to claim that real news is fake, but we have actual fake news being passed off as real. That's, of course, how the term fake news actually got started. Writing for BuzzFeed in December of 2017, the website's news media editor, Craig Silverman, wrote, quote, fake news is now both an empty slogan and a deeply troubling warning sign in an article explaining how he helped to popularize that term. He had been looking at websites and organizations that were designed to manufacture and perpetuate false news stories, from Canadian teenagers who made up stories about Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to sites that published articles about fictional terrorist attacks and others that fabricated election season political stories. Silverman says that he thought his investigations and the writing about the proliferation of these types of websites designed to get clicks and mislead people would actually lead to collective outrage and action. Instead, the term fake news has become a hyperpartisan cudgel. And Silverman is right. The term now means nothing because it is used so differently in so many different contexts that it has been rendered completely toothless. Nonetheless, websites continue to spread false news that gets picked up and then spread even further around social media, even as Facebook struggles to clamp down on it. So have you noticed recently, it's in the last six months or so, Facebook has um, started to add this little widget, and it invites you to investigate further something that you might be seeing on your social media feed, an article that somebody else has posted. <laughs> the problem is that this additional insight into the source of the article you're reading doesn't actually give you any information that might help you determine if it's trustworthy or not. So one article called Farmed Salmon, one of the most toxic foods in the world, caught my eye the other day. I clicked on the little info icon attached to the article and it told me that the source was Healthy Holistic Living, a media news company in Tarpon Springs, Florida and that the article was being shared in the US, mostly on the East and West Coast, and being shared in Western Europe. Okay, mildly interesting, but not particularly helpful in knowing whether or not I should trust this article, let alone eat farmed salmon. 
By the way, the Washington State Department of Health has clearly been fielding a lot of questions on this and whether farmed salmon is in fact the most toxic food in the world because it has a whole article on its website that starts by saying, our goal isn't to resolve the controversy about eating farmed or wild fish, but to encourage Washingtonians to eat two fish meals per week that are low in contaminants. <laughs> Duly noted. And in case you are curious about this, the conclusion about the contaminants from this health department is, and again I quote, early studies reported high levels of PCBs and other contaminants in farmed salmon, higher than in some species of wild salmon, like pink salmon. Follow-up studies haven't confirmed this, and the consensus among scientists and regulators is that farmed salmon and wild salmon are safe foods. Strict rules on contaminant levels in feed ingredients are now in place. Changes in feed have lowered contaminant levels in these fish. So there you go. Now I bet even the most savvy among you have clicked on an article like that and thought, oh my god, I shouldn't be eating farmed salmon. Or maybe you wrote off the article and then you thought about it as you stood in front of the fish counter at your local grocery store. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't. We should all obviously be thinking more carefully about what we eat and where it comes from. But one dodgy headline on Facebook about the dangers of farmed salmon is probably not the best way to keep yourself informed. NPR's Tim Mack reported last year on a company called Liarbird that can create a fake audio clip of someone saying something. Now it's Liarbird, L-Y-R-E, not liar, liar pants on fire. But that's essentially what it could become. The company created this technology ostensibly to give voice to people who have lost their voice through injury or illness. All you actually need is a minute or two of someone's voice. You upload it to the computer system. It then analyzes all of the component sounds of that person's timbre and pacing and lilt. And then you can get the computer generated version of the person's voice to say whatever you type up for it, which is a remarkable thing for people who don't have the ability to speak. In their promotional material, Lyrebird uses a computer-generated version of Barack Obama's voice as an example. And when you listen to it, it doesn't sound quite perfect, but it's totally recognizable as the former president. And it won't be long before it is absolutely pitch perfect and indistinguishable from the real life version of the person it's imitating. In his reporting, Max spoke with computer science professor Hani Farid, who was at Dartmouth at the time of the interview. Professor Farid says that this is a potential threat to democracy. Not only can people now put words into the mouths of prominent, powerful people who never said the things we will hear them saying, but Farid actually points out that this technology can give public officials a plausible escape clause for nearly anything they have ever said on tape. He specifically references the Access Hollywood tape, where now President Donald Trump tells Billy Bush about how he liked to grope women. Fareed says, quote, 18 months ago when that audio recording of President Trump came out on the bus, if that was today, you can guarantee it, he would have said it's fake. And he would have had some reasonable credibility in saying that as well, because there's no video associated with it. And in fact, at the end of last year, several news outlets reported that Donald Trump had started telling people that the voice on the recording was not his. Just last week, if we want to talk about video, a doctored version of a speech given by Nancy Pelosi made the rounds. It's still making the rounds on Facebook, where that company has not banned it. It slowed her speech down to about 75% of the rate of normal, and apparently it also altered the pitch of her voice so that it didn't sound as different as you would expect somebody talking more slowly at a sort of lowered and slowered speech level to speak at. And it seems designed to suggest that the Speaker of the House was either drunk or impaired in some way. And this video was then spread by the President's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, among others, I'm sure now you've heard the side-by-side -side comparison and you can distinguish the two versions of Nancy Pelosi speaking and having a, <laughs> which I find very sympathetic, um, a difficulty in getting a word out versus sounding like a whole paragraph with slurred speech. The speed with which this video traveled through social media and the degree to which it is now being covered by news organizations who want to clarify what was true and was not suggests that a lot of people may have thought that this video was real. 
And I'm not surprised. I mean, for one thing, it's hard to tell what's real and what's not, as we've just discussed with the technology that's out there, like Lyrebird. But also, depending on whom you hear the initial information from, you may be inclined to believe it, particularly if it confirms a bias you already hold. If you think Speaker Pelosi is terrible, and someone you trust, like perhaps Rudy Giuliani, or like the president who retweeted a different video of Pelosi stumbling over her words, or Fox News, where the video that Trump tweeted came from, you might believe that that was true. It sends out a video that doubles down on a view you already hold, and you may be inclined to believe it. Perhaps you're on the other side of the political spectrum. Do you think you're invulnerable to a doctored video of the president saying or doing something stupid? How likely are you to believe that if you see it traveling through Facebook or shared by people you love and trust? Again, that's one of the reasons that I highly recommend that you read or view publications that hold a perspective different from your own, because having that broad media diet will help you suss out the truth from the semi-truth or the downright fiction. So let, let me just do our tally here. We have real politicians telling us that real news is fake. We have fake news passing itself off as real news. And let's add a third to that. People who fully admit that they are not journalists, are not reporting the news, who are one of the main sources of news and information still for a large chunk of the US population. As far back as 2004, a Pew Research poll found that 20% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 29 regularly get campaign news from the internet, and 21% get election news from shows such as Saturday Night Live and The Daily Show. A more recent poll in 2015, conducted by the Public Religion Research Institute, which calls itself non-biased and non-partisan, and partners with the Roper Center for Public Policy Research, and with the left-leaning Atlantic Magazine and the Brookings Institution, said that 6% of all Americans and 11% of young Americans trusted The Daily Show and The Colbert Report the most of any TV sources, including major broadcast network news, cable sources like CNN, Fox News, and public television. There's been a lot of remedial education done by these hosts of these programs, which say, hey, we're comedy, we're satire, we're interview shows. And they do do their due duty to try to remind their audiences that they're not journalists. And yet still, we've essentially elevated late night comedy hosts to news anchor status. And these packages used on shows like The Daily Show, now hosted by Trevor Noah, do purport to tell you the news, even as they skewer it. But they don't just skewer it, they skew. You can hear them say, and this is true, when they really want you to know that whatever absurd thing they're about to say next is 100% factual, because the assumption should be that the rest of what they talk about could be a joke or a half-truth. Surely we know that all of these packages have been heavily edited. My stepfather, a few months ago, really wanted me to watch a segment with Daily Show correspondent Roy Wood Jr. after the Parkland shooting, when Wood went to a pro-gun rally in Montana. It was funny, and it was alarming. And boy, did the people he interviewed look stupid. One said he should be allowed to have a tank if he wanted it. This is America. Another person interviewed identified herself as a cage fighter and then repeated the conspiracy theory that the students from Parkland, Florida, who had been advocating for stricter gun control policies, were crisis actors. Those people were at the rally, but they didn't necessarily represent the majority of attendees. How many people did Wood interview or have to approach who would even agree, agree to an interview? How many people did he actually talk to who were not jaw-droppingly stupid enough to actually make the cut? People who were left on the digital equivalent of the cutting room floor because they were too articulate or not quite scary enough or maybe more modulated in their thinking. I don't know, maybe everyone at that pro-gun rally was like that. But we don't know because the correspondent wasn't a journalist and didn't have an obligation to present the news or even a realistic picture of what this event was. 
But if that's then what's being passed around, it fills a vacuum and it becomes what the perspective that a lot of Americans have is about what people who support guns are like. The pro-gun rally itself was worth covering and rallies like this have been as news items. We covered them at VPR last year when gun legislation was moving through the State House. But when people are only seeing the Daily Show package and using that as their sense of the news, can you really blame them for thinking that all gun owners are bumbling idiots who just want to shoot everything up and can't see the irony in a gun rights rally that they didn't bring their own guns to? I, for one, could see a different way to cover that story. But again, The Daily Show is not a news program. It doesn't want to be beholden to the same ethics and practices that news organizations are beholden to, and nor should it be. But again, if that's how Americans are getting their news, we have a problem. Back to our tally. We have people who don't like real news trying to tell us it's fake, fake news trying to tell us it's real, non-news being treated as journalism, and I'll just tick off a couple more. There are actually nefarious people on Twitter who doctor screenshots from responsible journalists to make them look like legitimate, time-stamped, unethical, or racially biased tweets, tweets these journalists never actually sent. When Miami Herald reporter Alex Harris started covering the shooting at Parkland High School in February of last year, some Twitter users started tweeting out screenshots of her tweets that were changed from what she had originally sent. These screenshots made it look like Harris was asking Parkland students to send her photos of dead bodies and that she had been asking, is the shooter white? Not only were these false, but Harris says they severely hampered her ability to do her job. Because people thought she was being unethical or they thought she was race baiting, other people started harassing her. One user followed every tweet she sent where she was actually trying to get information and told the target of that tweet not to talk to Harris because she was a racist. Harris found herself not only unable to do the breaking news reporting she was trying to do, but also the target of an intense amount of hatred and abuse, death threats, in fact. Now, we also have journalists tweeting erroneous information about potential mass shooters and their motives. Remember that shooting at Google headquarters? Now, reputable news sources were tweeting and retweeting information that suggested this was a shooting motivated by a domestic situation. It, in fact, was not. Let me point you out to my earlier statement about anything you're reading on Twitter. I don't know how many of you are on Twitter, but if you are, if you're reading anything in a breaking news situation, you should consider it unverified, even if it comes from a reputable news source. So I spent this entire talk so far reconsidering what I thought was a fairly lazy statement by my neighbor that she just doesn't know what to trust anymore and that she's better off not paying attention to the news at all. And I'm starting to think maybe she's right. Who can keep up? Who can tell what's real from what's fake? And who has the time, frankly? This is a perilous and incredibly important moment for journalism. We really need good reporters and good reporting. And we need people to be reading it and keeping themselves informed. As people turn away from journalism and the distrust of the media continues to grow, and as Americans turn more and more to the sources that validate their already held opinions, it's more important than ever to have the facts, to have intelligent analysis, and to have reporters who are digging and picking at threads and speaking truth to power. The Pointer Institute released a media trust survey in December of last year, which found that nearly half of all Americans think the media makes up stories about the president, 44%. 74% of Republicans believe that to be true. But, and this is true as they say in comedy news, the fact that 49% of Americans said they do trust the news media to report stories fairly and accuracy, accurately is actually an uptick. It's the highest percentage since 9-11. In analyzing the results of the survey for Pointer, the organization's Newmark Chair in Journalism Ethics, Indira Lakshmanan, who is a columnist for the, Washington, for the Boston Globe, and who has been a Washington national and political foreign correspondent for various media outlets wrote, the findings should be a fire alarm for newsrooms. 
A widespread fundamental misunderstanding among the public of what we do points to an urgent need to be more transparent about how and why we report news. With so much at stake and so many landmines, we do need to do a couple of things within the news media. One is to just buckle down and do the work, try to have a thick skin. And to be honest, that's what most of us do most of the time. If we thought about all of this stuff swirling around, or if we thought about every person who said how terrible we were, how stupid we were, or if you're a woman in journalism, how ugly you are, how bad your voice is, or anything else that applies to women, we'd never get another newscast out the door. But we also have to do better, and I can think of a couple ways we need to improve. One is diversity. And I know that, like fake news, diversity is a word that almost means nothing. But it is crucial to have more perspectives included in our newsmaking process and in positions of power. I'm not just talking about racial diversity, although that is really important. But we also need to have newsrooms where the people in them come from different backgrounds, have different perspectives, and are active in different communities, <clears throat> like southern Vermont. Of course, reporters always work hard to make sure that the voices we reach out to have that diversity. And you're never going to have people in your newsroom who can represent every facet of every community. But the decisions about what to cover and how to cover them are made first in the news meeting. And so a lot of this lack of perspective, lack of difference about other communities shapes our coverage. It shapes what stories we go after, and it shapes how we decide to frame them. At VPR, for example, our mission is to explore the whole Vermont story together. We take that seriously, and I think we do a good job of it. But there is room and certainly need for improvement. We're certainly aware of a lack of racial diversity on our staff. It's more or less in line with the demographics of the state, but it's still an issue. But I'm equally concerned about what I see as a narrowing of geographic diversity in the newsroom. Frequently, when we think about a story, the people trying to figure out what angle to cover it with or how to even start out are living in the most urban environment in Vermont. Most of our staff members who work out of our Colchester headquarters live in Burlington, South Burlington, Essex, or Winooski. That shapes the conversation. Perspectives on agriculture, food, transportation, aging, infrastructure, even requirements for motor vehicle inspections are different in Burlington than they are if you live in Franklin County or Island Pond or Manchester. My husband works in a factory, and he volunteers in our local fire department, and he's not a US citizen. I often find myself thinking about him and his colleagues when we talk about what to cover and what angles to take on Vermont Edition. Sometimes I bring that conversation back to him. By the way, we live in Addison County, so we don't live in Chittenden County. <laughs> and he often reminds me that the conversations he's having with his colleagues about the Me Too movement, or about Nancy Pelosi, or about economic development, or about trade wars and the minimum wage feel very different from the conversations that my more affluent college friends are having about these emails on, are having about these issues on emails or on Slack. And it's really important, I think, to have these different constituencies and different perspectives in mind as we begin to shape our news coverage. So we need to do a better job of having people from all income brackets, from many different socioeconomic classes, and from different geographic perspectives in our newsroom. And I'll give you a concrete example. Sarah McCammon covers politics for NPR. And she opened up at the end of the last campaign cycle about her own background. She grew up in a strict evangelical household in Kansas City, Missouri. And her fluency in that language helped her gain access to a big meeting between then-candidate Trump and evangelical leaders, which other reporters weren't even able to access. Her understanding of evangelical communities not only meant better access, it also meant much more nuanced reporting. She wasn't reporting from the outside looking in. She was able to have an insider's perspective that helped give her reporting a different tone and really helped listeners understand things in a way that outside reporting just didn't. 
It's important to have the ability to access, access these different constituencies. And I also find that this happens in Vermont frequently in reporting about guns and gun control. If you know how to talk about guns, you're gonna get a lot further with the gun owners you wanna to talk to than if you look like you've smelled something rotten every time you say the word firearm. Why should we care what gun owners think? A poll VPR conducted a couple years ago now with the Castleton Polling Institute suggests that half of all Vermont households have guns in them, half. That same poll found that the overwhelming majority of people in Vermont, including gun owners, supported some form of gun control. 89% of Vermonters as a whole said they supported at least some restrictions. 82% of gun owners said that. And we saw that reflected this year and last year as we've talked about gun control issues in Vermont. So you've no doubt heard those statistics nationally. They're actually pretty similar in the national conversation as they are in Vermont. But what we didn't hear in reporting about gun control last year were the voices of gun owners who were represented by that figure. So it's no wonder that people who don't own guns consider people who do own guns to be dangerous, scary, and obstinate, perhaps even backwards and stupid. If all they're hearing is the Daily Show package about what gun owners think. That's the perspective on gun owners that non-gun owners have. It doesn't reflect reality. And it's not gonna help when we try to make public policy, when we try to find empathy, when we try to communicate with people who we think may be different from us. We need more accurate reporting, and some of that is having reporters who are able to find nuance with sources who feel like they can trust the reporters they're speaking to. It's also important to the audience. People pick up on verbal cues to try to figure out who you as a news organization think your audience is, who you think you're speaking to. I often think of an interview that I heard on The Pub which is a now defunct industry podcast about public media, it's very niche. The host, Adam Ragusea, interviewed a woman named Stephanie Fu, who was a producer on This American Life. And Fu had written, which was something that was rightly referred to as a manifesto. And it was called, What to Do If Your Workplace is Too White. In this interview with Ragusea, they talked about her essay, and Fu talked about an episode of This American Life that had recently aired. In that episode of This American Life, a reporter named Zoe Chase was talking to host Ira Glass about burgers, hamburgers. Hamburgers that actually had never been made, but, and I, I don't know the full context for this, so it sounds very odd, but it was about a list of burger ideas that the restaurant chain Hardee's keeps that employees have come up with. And one of them was a Beyonce burger. It has honey, and if you like it, you put an onion ring on it, Chase says. <laughs> and she and Glass laughed. And then Ira Glass says in this broadcast, I just wanna say for older people, there's a song by Beyonce, and Zoe Chase interrupts him to say, everybody knows the song, you don't have to explain it. And Stephanie Fu says that the show got hate mail about that exchange from older white people who said, how dare you? How dare you not explain that to me? You are not valuing me as a listener when you don't explain who Beyonce is and not all of us know the Put a Ring on It song. And Fu says in this interview with Adam Ragusea, good, good that you finally had to Google something that it was not made exactly for you and your experience. And then she talks about how the very idea of what we radio hosts choose to explain and what we just assume our audience already knows is this auditory cue to our audience about who they think we are. And it translates who we think we're making our media for. As the host of Vermont Edition, I think about that statement, that idea, all the time that what I say is a code to people who I think of as my audience. It's saying who I welcome, who I think the insiders are, who I think the outsiders are, what I think I need to explain because my audience wouldn't know, and what I think is common knowledge to my core audience. 
Now, thinking about that in the middle of a live broadcast is difficult and fraught. But it's important to make sure that I'm not just doing a show about other people, but that I'm welcoming to all audiences, particularly when the topic of the conversation may be something that is not as familiar to a core demographic of affluent, older white people. In my own personal listening, I try to listen, especially now, to podcasts that are not made with me in mind both to get a sense of what that feels like to be an outsider to that conversation and to train myself to be a better ally, to be a better listener, and to understand what is actually happening in communities that I may not be a part of. So I listen to podcasts in Spanish. I've lost a lot of my Spanish, so I find this incredibly frustrating. But it also reminds me what it's like to try to understand your second language and to try to carry on a conversation and continue it. It's exhausting. I listen to podcasts made by and for women of color, made by and about Muslim Americans, and by and about queer Americans. And I love to listen to an Australian podcast called Ladies We Need to Talk that breaks down taboos about things that women think about but perhaps don't want to speak about. So I'm trying to listen to podcasts that I'm both a core key demographic in and ones that I will never be a key demographic in, but I also then have a little bit of knowledge as I go into other conversations. So, you know, we wring our hands about not attracting a diverse audience in public radio that's especially about age and socioeconomic status, but then we're fearful of creating any content that doesn't serve the demographic that we already have. So, duh. We're not going to get young people of color to listen to us if all of our content is made with a different demographic in mind. And if we want to reach the half of Americans who believe the media makes up stories and the overwhelming number of Republicans who believe that, we have to do a better job of making them feel like they too are our audience. I don't think that we often realize how much of our language is culturally coded with a nod to the people we feel most familiar with. And studies have shown that in most newsrooms, the majority of reporters and editorial uh, staff members are Democrats and are white and are male. So we need to do better with this question of diversity and perspective. But there's one more thing I want to talk about before I let you all get on with your rainy evening. And this is the one that causes me the most heartburn right now. One of the foundational tenets of straight news reporting is the ideal of objectivity. It's under assault right now, and I think that's a problem. I mentioned Jay Rosen, the NYU professor, the other uh, a few minutes ago. He's a, a professor in the School of Journalism. And he's a very prominent critic of this idea of the voice from nowhere. It's an idea that a reporter must stay completely neutral and report both sides of any story equally, as if all perspectives, opinions, or ideas have equal weight. Rosen frequently calls out public radio, in particular, for focusing on this kind of view from nowhere journalism. And I think we've pretty well established at this point that that idea actually doesn't hold merit anymore, if it ever did. You cannot report with a view from nowhere. And all angles, all opinions don't all deserve equal time. I don't deny that we frequently fall into this kind of false narrative. But I think that we have moved beyond the idea that this is how we should practice journalism. On Vermont Edition, the show that I host, for example, we made a decision almost a decade ago now to stop trying to offer a point counterpoint on the question of global warming and climate change. Way back when we got started, we would hem and haw, did we need to find a climate science denier to be a guest on a show about climate change so we could present an objective or balanced view of the topic? And you know, thinking back on it, it felt really risky a decade ago to say, no, we're not going to do that anymore. Now it seems obvious. But we looked at it then as an ethical decision to present the overwhelmingly established science as our starting point, despite the fact that some, even very powerful national politicians, even today, maintain a position that they are unconvinced that climate change is caused by human activity. We found that the conversations we had once we did away with that false equivalency were deeper and more meaningful, because we weren't bogged down by that debate 
And instead, we could move to really serious and tricky and complex and adversarial questions of what now? Or even, why do people deny the science? Or what is the right policy? How fast can we move on these things? Those are conversations that have a lot of nuance and a lot of angles, and boy, it gets heated. But we're not having a conversation about whether climate change is real. If people are going to trust journalists, they have to trust not just that they're getting different sides of an argument, but that the journalist has done some work to figure out what is actually true, and not just take someone's statement, a potentially false statement, or one designed to misguide the audience, and pass it off as objectivity. It's our job, especially when people are shouting and when the news is like a fire hose coming at you all the time, to do some sifting, to give you context, to help you understand what's true, what's false, and what's political. I will also say that hosting a live show means that is a particular challenge, because you don't always know, even as much as we try to be researched, whether someone live on air is saying something that's true or not. And so it's something that I go to bed at night and just lie awake thinking, what am I going to do if somebody says something that's patently false and I don't catch it? Then you make a correction. You do the best you can. Sometimes we even do stories after the fact. For example, I said in one show a few months ago something about fentanyl being very dangerous for first responders, because if they could touch the substance, they might overdose. And we were pretty immediately schooled um, by people who said, that's not true. That is a false narrative. And so what we did was we investigated that. And then we did a whole new show about it to try to inform people about fentanyl, which, yes, is an extremely dangerous drug, but is not very easily taken up by the body just through skin contact. And in fact, to my knowledge, no law enforcement or first responders have ever actually had an adverse reaction to fentanyl, despite the number of collapses um, of medical incidents that they've had that seem to be connected to touching fentanyl. And I'm working on a story about that for National Public Radio right now. So I agree that we need to do away with the idea of the view from nowhere. And it's absolutely the job of reporters to help explain when ideas are outside of the mainstream or not reported by science. Analysis is not something that should just be left up to pundits. It's part of our job, and it is, in fact, one of the most difficult parts. You have to make judgment calls. But a reporter's research and understanding of a story should help give him or her the foundation for explaining these kinds of things. Hiding false equivalency under the idea of objectivity is not serving our audience. But I'm very concerned that some journalists are using that idea that we should do away with that kind of objectivity as an excuse to share their own feelings and opinions on the news they cover. That's not reporting. That's an op-ed. It's not our job to share our personal feelings, to advocate for positions, or to reveal our political persuasions. Especially since the election of Donald Trump to the presidency, a lot of internal conversations in our newsroom, and I suspect in other newsrooms, based on the number of think pieces and debates I've been reading, mean that journalists are concerned that they have to subsume their personal viewpoints, their individuality, in favor of their jobs. I just turned 40. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess I still think of myself as fairly young, but in this case, I feel like I fit squarely into the old school frame of thinking. You do. You do have to agree to let go of your own righteous anger as it pertains to you individually, as your own personal self, if you want to be a journalist. You don't get to post on your Facebook wall about whether or not you agree with something that Congress has done. You don't get to go to the Women's March and wear a pussy hat in public. Mm -hmm. It's not about you. It's about clarity. It's about illuminating the voices of others, voices that are not always heard. It's not about expressing your own perspective and pushing your personal viewpoint forward. Journalists, at least those of us who purport to present news and analysis from a relatively straight ahead perspective, have a huge platform, a huge bullhorn. And that comes with tremendous responsibility. 
I don't share my perspective because I believe that's a distraction. I absolutely interrogate my own viewpoint and my own experience to try to make sure that I'm not letting my blind spots take over my coverage. So let me be very clear. I am not saying that a news person's perspective doesn't influence their coverage. Clearly it does. And we should be accounting for that in our work. But no one cares what I believe about gun control or GMOs. My personal feelings and belief are generally not part of the story. Sharing them would obfuscate a larger search for the truth. When I started in journalism, when I was 22 and just out of college, I, I didn't think that was up for debate. I mean, I don't believe that you have to abandon your humanity to be a journalist, but advancing your perspective as part of your role as a journalist is anathema to what I feel like my job is. And if that's not something that you can stomach, don't become a reporter. Go practice advocacy journalism for an organization that is transparent about its viewpoint. We currently live in a culture that believes everything we do or think should be shared on social media, broadcast to the public. And that's certainly feeding into the way journalists think about their lives and the way their work impinges on their rights to share their own thoughts. And in fact, people like me who host shows, we're encouraged to be brands, we're encouraged to be personalities. So I'm often thinking about, should I share this photo of my children out in the wilderness, but probably not share the one of my messy house because you're creating a brand. I'm immensely privileged to have a mouthpiece, to have a voice that broadcasts across the state, occasionally across the nation. And it is my responsibility as part of that privilege to make sure that I'm interrogating my blind spots, my biases, my values, but also that I do practice the self-immolation necessary to illuminate other people's voices, to make sure that I'm open and critical and curious and skeptical and full of wonder and joy and empathy and love. I can't do that if I'm worried about how to present myself on social media or on my show. There are those who say it's impossible to take your own perspective out of your reporting. And as I said before, it certainly shapes our coverage, which is why we need greater diversity in our newsrooms to begin with. But I think we can make journalism more trusted and more trustworthy, not by sharing how we fit into our stories, but by doing a better job of explaining whose voices and what perspectives are factoring into our reporting. In her writing about that pointer survey, reporter Indira Lakshmanan suggests that, quote, remedies to begin restoring audience trust include annotating stories and linking original documents and images to show how we know what we know, and publishing reports and videos taking the audience step by step through ethical standards, methods, sourcing, and fact checking. Absolutely. I hesitate to share any of this with you, particularly with a camera here, because we live in a moment where your concerns, your worries, your thoughts, anything you say get tweeted, get doctored, get changed, or get used out of context to suit someone else's viewpoints. But if we as journalists cannot be transparent about the fissures in our industry and about the ways we think of our own jobs and our own futures and our own lives, we can't expect to gain or regain the trust for those for whom the news media is just too confusing to bother following. We need more transparency. We need more diversity of perspective and experience. And we need a lot less of our own self-righteousness if we are going to survive this moment of crisis in journalism and culture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I'm happy to take questions on that subject or anything else, journalism, public radio, um, children related, if you have them. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, wait for the microphone. That way you can be on tape, too. 
Thank you so much. That was uh, fascinating. Uh, one piece of the fake news puzzle that I don't think you explicitly addressed was the influence or the meddling of foreign governments. And as a newsroom professional, I'd love your uh, thoughts on that, particularly through the lens of covering the 2020 election and helping assure um, fair elections. Yeah, you know, as a local newsroom, we like to think that we're kind of immune to that, which Clearly we're not, because I think one of the ways that foreign governments exert this influence is by winning the minds of all of us. So, you know, we're all, we're all reading, ideally, a broad variety of news sources. But if some of those are influenced by outside sources and forces, then we're all certainly influenced by how that shapes our newsroom coverage. Um, you know, we think about it, we haven't started to think about how we want to cover the 2020 election other than covering Bernie Sanders, because frankly, that's not our job. We, let to, we like to leave that to others. And I think in New Hampshire Public Radio and other media organizations that do more with coverage of all of the candidates, they're thinking about that a whole lot more than we are. And, you know, to be honest, it's actually not a conversation that we've had as a news department. I think about it in the way that I think about all of these terrifying things in that I'm sure it's shaping how I see the world and I don't know how. And I think that, that when we have foreign organizations who are trying to influence our ideas, that is the most insidious form of manipulation because we believe, we all believe ourselves to be autonomous beings who shape our own thoughts based on knowledge and facts and our own minds. And we know certainly that that's not true. So I do think we're all influenced by it. And at VPR, we try to assume that if we know our communities, that that's one way to fight that. So if we're actually reporting on communities that we know, if we're actually reporting from the state house, we have two reporters who are in the state house every day. So they're in the committee rooms and they're on the floor. So they know what's happening there. If I'm reporting on the dairy industry in Franklin and Addison County, I go there. Now, I may be getting fed a line by somebody who believes something that they learned because of foreign influence, but at least I know what's happening in my own community. And again, I think that goes to the, the point of having news organizations that, and reporters that are based within their own communities and that have that geographic um, perspective and diverse perspective because that is, to my mind, the way to fight that, is to be in your own community, to do small local reporting, and for large national organizations to rely more heavily than they do on the local news organizations who are making the news. NPR is doing a little bit better at that than it used to, and they've started to form partnerships this cycle with Iowa Public Radio and New Hampshire Public Radio, for example, to in interview all of the Democratic candidates all 23 plus of them who are running for president. And I think that that's one of the ways they're trying to combat it so that you're not asking questions as an outsider, you're asking questions as an insider. But it terrifi that terrifies me. So thanks. <laughs> um, first, Jane, I want to thank you for um, sharing so honestly uh, how you struggle yourself uh, with, with these issues, with the, um, the assault on, on journalism as it is, and also to congratulate you on the air for how well you handle that. Uh, I think you're one of the best uh, that I hear. I'm a regular listener to Vermont Edition. I think you do just a, a marvelous job of keeping yourself out of the, Thank you. the conversation. <laughs> My question is, um, uh, in, give, given the controversy that it surrounds journalism today, uh, what impact, if any, is that having on uh, the willingness of young people coming out of colleges and universities to enter journalism? Is it having uh, any kind of a dampening effect, or is it having the opposite effect? You know, I don't know statistically. I know that the effect it's having within the organizations that I'm a part of and within our newsroom and within you know, wider sort of online journalism communities is mostly this question of, do I get to be a real person and still be a journalist? And being a real person these days seems to mean being able to be on social media, but also having everything that you did 
in college and high school and before that you may have posted online still visible to people. And so it's this, I, I think part of the fear is this idea that not only do you have to give up some of the privileges of being a, you know, a person who shares everything on social media, but you have to have done so when you were 15, when you didn't know you wanted to be a journalist. And you know, I grew up, I, I graduated from college in 2001, which was right, we were just getting email in high school and college. You know, Facebook started a couple years after I graduated. And we didn't have that kind of stuff. And so whatever I believed or whatever I wanted to do to experiment with who I was going to be and what my beliefs were, were more or less private, you know, unless I wrote for a publication, which I didn't. And so I think that that's probably hard for people who want to go into journalism today is how much of my past is visible and how much of my past is going to influence whether news directors hire me. I mean, we, when we do interviews and candidate searches, we look. So we try to find, and sometimes we do find things and we say, I don't know, this person, you know, this person has been writing this about um, the situation in Israel. And I think in some ways we probably do have to be more open to the idea that people have viewpoints and that they will have shared them. And so how, uh, to that question of transparency, if we can have a journalist who may be known to have a, a certain perspective, but who can then annotate her reporting and say, this is where I got this source, this is where this comes from, these are the number of people who I interviewed before I got the quote that is used in this article. I think that goes a long way toward alleviating some of the concern about people having had viewpoints before. But I think more people are interested in reporting than they used to be. It's just in what form. You know, is it going to be YouTube stars? Is it going to be people who are reporting for community newspapers? And as we see more newspapers go under, I think this, this idea of hyper-local reporting is becoming more important and more popular. And so you see a lot of journalists starting there, which I think is really great. I mean, some of the student journalists in this state who are reporting from their college communities either about what's happening on campus or about what's happening in town. Um, I mentor some students sometimes at Middlebury College because that's the college closest to where I live. And the reporting that they're doing is really phenomenal on their own college communities and on the town gown stuff. And some of, some of these conversations that are happening nationally are happening in a much more distilled way in local communities. And so you can get that reporting on the ground that's equally as important as the conversation that's happening on NBC News. So again, I don't know statistically whether it's dampening the interest. I think when people think about how to make enough money to survive, that's dampening the interest. <laughs> but the idea of, yeah, of being a journalist is still exciting, at least to the students who say, can I come and watch Vermont Edition, which is gratifying. Thanks. Um, I've recently made um, the transition from a long career in journalism to the realm of politics and advocacy. And the thing that I have found most discouraging um, is when I'm trying to make up my mind about an issue, you know, as a journalist, my first thought is to go to the stats, right, to look for the numbers. And um, I'm finding that so many studies are funded by advocacy groups um, or even by quote-unquote nonpartisan organizations that are known to have, you know, even the slightest tilt. And then when you try to drill all the way down and find scholarly articles, you find competing scholarly articles. So um, I've found it tough um, in today's world to find reliable statistics that I can use to either buttress or, you know, counteract an argument or a policy position. And I just wonder, what is your take on that? I, you're right. That's my take on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally true. And, you know, I was listening to a really interesting episode of the NPR Politics podcast recently, and they did a whole episode on polling. And one of the things they said is, without, without a lot of polls, it's hard to get a good sense. If you just have one poll, that's one moment in time, and it's perhaps done by an organization that didn't do a poll very well, didn't have a big enough sample size, didn't use people who have cell phones. You know, if that's your only um, data point, then you don't have enough information to go on. But if you have a lot of organizations doing polling, I mean, this is obviously 
in most cases to do with politics. But if you have a lot of organizations doing polling and you have all of these data points, they start to coalesce in a way that can give you more reliable information. Again, knowing that polls are moment in time things and not designed to be, you know, this is exactly what's going to happen. So one of the ways that local media organizations are trying to combat that is by partnering. And that's what we're doing at VPR. That's one of the main conversations we've been having is how can we partner with other news organizations so the things like that, either studies or polls or deep research that we can't afford on our own, either because we don't have the actual money or because we don't have the staff time to devote to it, can be kind of distributed among and between organizations. So we're going to have a poll come out later this year with Vermont Public Television. And so by pooling our resources, not only are we pooling the, the financial resources to have a much more robust poll, but then we can also farm out the reporting in different ways. And so there are different perspectives on that. So VPR reporters will be doing some of the near term, interesting, like quick reporting on that. And the public television will be doing longer form reporting. And we're not actually going to probably be concentrating just on politics. It's more likely to be issues polling and, and um, sort of taking a pulse of where Vermonters are on a lot of different issues that can help then inform other reporting. So one of the ways that I see news organizations trying to address that lack of studies is by partnering. Because traditionally, it hasn't been our job to do necessarily to do that research. It's our job to take that research and analyze it and report on it. And without it coming out, we're at a loss as well for how to have those really good data points. And when we see media organizations either combine into one organization or just go away, there are then even fewer people to do the research that reporters do. So you have even fewer data points. And I think you're right. It's, it's absolutely a problem for any of us who are in reporting or for any of us who just want to be informed citizens who are trying to get to the research and the data to then make our own decisions. And I don't have a solution for that. Well, I appreciate that individual journalists can have a strong moral compass. I'd like to know what you think about the, the organizational biases we see. <clears throat> I mean, Rupert Murdoch got Margaret Thatcher into power. He then switched parties and got Tony Blair into power. Then he came here, and the result is Donald Trump. I wonder if you can comment on that. Probably not as intelligently as you'd like, but I would turn it back a little bit to say I think we have abdicated our own personal responsibility for being well-informed citizens. And we do too often rely on a media organization, whichever one it may be, that confirms our bias. And we're going we're gonna to have more stratification, and we're going to have less informed people if, if what we generally as media consumers do is only seek out the organizations that we think we agree with. You know, when we do political coverage, we get vicious complaints from people who don't like the coverage in whichever direction. And whenever we have a, you know, a gubernatorial election cycle, I will get um, many complaints that say, I'm in the pocket of the Republicans. And then half as many again that say, I'm clearly a liberal, and everything I do has a liberal bias. And I think, you know, I actually do read all of those and think, OK, well, what was it that gave that person that idea? And is there something that I should be changing? Or is there something that I'm unconsciously revealing about myself in one way or another, or that I'm not asking fairly? But I think also it's just that people don't like to hear something that paints the person that they like in a bad light. And so we're not, we're not helping ourselves when we only rely on one organization to get our news. And then we, we use that to confirm our biases. And then we go to the polling place. But yeah, big media organizations are, especially ones that you mentioned, say, we're news. It's one individual, but then it's an organization that filters down with a mindset. And if, if they're not transparent about that mindset, there are people who don't know it and who then believe things to be reported as news that aren't. And those of us who then are trying to fact check the news to present different sides when that's appropriate are at a disadvantage because other people will say, yeah, but I already heard it from Fox News or I already heard it from The Daily Show even. 
you know, that you get these perspectives that are not actually based on straight ahead reporting and people then don't believe the straight ahead reporting because it doesn't confirm to what they've already heard from the organization that bolsters their political viewpoint. I mean, at, at public radio, one of the values that we have held is that we, you know, and I won't do the fun drive because that's coming up next week. <laughs> Be warned. But, you know, we really do appreciate that there's nobody telling us what to do. And in fact, you know, sometimes people will say, I'm a sustaining member in their note to me. And it's like, I don't even want to know. I don't care whether you're a sustaining member or not because that's not going to influence whether we, you know, do, do your book. Um, <laughs> and so when you have a network of local reporting stations, of local stations that are doing work in their communities, again, I know I've come back to this a couple times, but I think that's one of the solutions because NPR has its own, is its own juggernaut and has its own reporters, but when they rely on local stations to do that local reporting, I think local communities are better at policing their own local media. You do know the sources. I literally do get stopped in the grocery store. If I say something wrong, somebody will tell me, <clears throat> and they call me. You know, my email's on the website. And so people, I think, have access to local journalists and hold them a little bit closer to the truth than national organizations. And so if you have a network that's made up of a lot of local organizations that are feeding information to the national one, you're more likely to have more accurate information. And that disconsolidation may be the way to go in the future for, for all media. I came from Marketplace in Los Angeles before I moved back to Vermont. And I remember thinking at the time that you could have this distance when you were working at Marketplace or when I was at NPR, a, a distance that can sometimes be helpful because you're not entangled in your own community, you're not sort of, you don't feel like you're a part of it and that that's going to influence how you report on something, but it also means you don't really have to care about how your reporting affects the lives of people. And it's one of the things that I most value about living in and working in and reporting on Vermont because I see every day how our reporting affects actual people's lives. And so when you actually, it was one of the things we did in anthropology when I was an undergraduate too, was this question of, um, of anthropologists who would drop in and get a community to reveal all of its secrets about how its community operated. And then the anthropologist would go write a book and it was full of bombs that were dropped on this community and the anthropologist was long gone because you know, he didn't care what happened in that community that now all of these social ties were explained and perhaps causing fissures within the community. And so there, there was a movement in anthropology um, in the last century to try to get a little bit more informed on how being an anthropologist can affect a community. And I've always thought of journalism as basically anthropology. And so we're trying to do a better job of understanding how what we do actually affects the communities. And when you think about it that way, you have a lot better chance of getting to the truth. Thank you. I have a process question about your program from our audition. I have to compliment you for every topic that's covered throughout the year, and there are a lot of them. You seem to be spot on with rapid fire questions right in the moment. It's so good. Uh, but I have a question about the background on that is how, how, how big is the staff that, and how, what's the lead time on the preparation for a program, and how much homework do you end up doing for a program? We have three full time producers plus me, and we all get together usually on Wednesdays and we discuss what we want to do for the following week. And we usually, usually have one main topic and then one secondary topic. And so the main topic usually has phone calls. And we call them our A topic and our B topic. So we'll try to, f try to pick for the next full week if things aren't already filled in. Um, and then each day is assigned a producer. And so the producer then has the job of figuring out what's the right angle, who are the right guests? What is the information that Jane needs to have in her brain? Um, so today we did mosquitoes. And one of the things we had talked about was, should we have an entomologist on to talk about the life cycle of mosquitoes? And we decided we've done that before, maybe not this time. Uh, we'll talk more about 
mosquito testing and how the, the state monitors it. Uh, but then we also didn't have a total policy expert who could talk about why the legislature has not apportioned more money to the mosquito control districts, which turned out to be one of the big questions of the show. So we felt like, oh no, did we get that one wrong? But that was Rick's and Gary's job today to figure out who's actually available, what's the right combination of guests, and then you know exactly what direction are we gonna go. And every day we'll do that, and then the producers give me a digital packet the night before the show. Um, and I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old at home. <laughs> so I put them to bed, which can be any time between 8 and 11, you know, 8 and 8.30. And then I read the notes for the next day. And so for me, it's like cramming for a test. So I think of my job as the sort of tip of the iceberg, and the producers have done a ton of research beforehand, not only to get the information to give to me, but to decide what information not to give to me because they know that there's only a certain amount I can actually hold in my brain for that show. And then I cram. And then I get in in the morning and I write a script and I write questions and I generally follow the script because it's just the intro and the little, what we call the throat of the break, which is, you know, here's how to get in touch with us. We're talking about this. Coming up, we'll talk about that. Uh, and then I typically don't follow the questions. I try to have an arc. I try to think of it as sort of a narrative in the same way you would with a reported story. So ideally, we'll follow this path. And at the end, we'll get to this nice little moment that you get to leave with. But it rarely goes that way. <laughs> <laughs> and that's typically how we operate. And then if you ask me what show we did last week, my dad will sometimes say, that was a great show you had on Wednesday. It's like, what, what did we do on Wednesday? <laughs> I mean, it's not in my brain anymore. So it's, yeah, it's very much like cramming for a test. And it's very much the production staff that's doing the lion's share of the work. And then I get the glory. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs>